How many of you actually, oh, before I start my motivation, <laughs> this is a short outline of my today's talk. So I'm going to talk about motivation and go to the live demo right away. And then talking about the core technologies behind the scene and also the applications and then making a summary. So how many of you actually have watched the movie uh, Her? Show of hands. Great. That's why you're working AI, right? So for those of you who haven't watched it, I highly recommend it, especially your interest in AI. Basically, her, it's a romantic science fiction. It describes an intelligent computer system, that's a her, and uh, she serves as the human companion who is uh, basically the main character, Theodore. And here, for those of you especially who haven't watched the movie, I have a very short clip of their conversation in the movie. Just signing the divorce papers. Is there anything else, though? No, just that. Okay. Why do you do that? What? Nothing. It's just you go because you're speaking, and it seems odd. Hmm. So this is a conversation between her, which is a computer system, and the human, right, Theodore. So now, for, especially for those of you who haven't watched it, I'm just wondering what's on your mind after you heard this conversation. To be honest, I watched the movie, I think during the Christmas season, about a couple of years ago. Then I told myself, I really want to have a her of my own. Of course, with a very different purpose than Theodore wants her. And then I have a great friend, right? I can complain to her whenever I want, whatever I want, without burdening my human friends or my husband. Don't get me wrong, I have a great husband, but who just doesn't want to hear my complaint? But who would? <laughs> so of course, there is a huge gap between the fiction and the reality. So for the past four years at GG, we're a very small startup. We have been working on creating a new class of a conversational agent. So now I'm going to right, go to the demo. Actually, this part makes me most nervous <laughs> because normally a demo doesn't quite uh, uh, always. So um, I'm going to switch to see. I'm just trying to do the keyboard. So actually, uh, this demo is on our website. Don't, don't try it uh, right now. <laughs> you can do it later. <laughs> you can do it later. Uh, so let me go through my demo first. <laughs> So uh, I'm just going to start. So this is a kind of like a virtual receptionist, right? So the whole point of here it is, uh, we don't know who are visiting GG website. And we, know, we want to know a little bit more about this person so we can follow up. So that's a kind of a purpose of this one. Hope it works. It's very small, can you see it? It's kind of hard, right? It's a little bit hard. So basically, this one just said is, uh, Hello, come in, and Michelle, your name sound, seems familiar. Because we don't uh, keep track of every user has account per se, so we just based on name, based on email sometimes. In this case, I say, sure. I say, let's start. I'm just going to repeat what it says, because in case people sit behind and couldn't see. And uh, Gigi said it is, I'd like to learn your needs and pass them along to my human colleagues to best help you. Could you tell me? about yourself in two to three sentences. For example, what kind of work do you do and your specialty? Because we want to know what kind of people are here, right? So then I said it is, uh, hello, maybe say just a short one, GG. So I just say, hi GG, how are you doing today? I'm doing great, thanks for asking, how about you? So basically, I didn't really go with the GG, right? I didn't try to answer his question. Then I said, uh, I'm doing great too. Say great. And GG doesn't do anything now. Then I'm learning, I'm a user, what I should I do? I said is, uh, what's now? Juju is still waiting for me to give the answer back. And Juju said, not much really. Uh, just follow my flow, answer my question above. Then, because I don't want to scroll back, because I'm just wondering. So, 
What's the question? Here you go. Okay, you interrupt me. Let me check. Here you go. Could you please introduce yourself? Then I say this. Could you introduce yourself first? <laughs> so you can think about it. I said, my bad. I sort of introduced myself already. I'm an AI being. My specialty is to chat with you, learn your needs, and pass it along to my human colleagues. It's time to go back to my question. So Gigi always actually remember what he needs to do, it needs to do. Could you please introduce yourself? Then I say, I'm a computer scientist and uh, work on creating AI agents just like you. Whoa, you must, <laughs> wow, nice. <laughs> if you go there, they will say the same thing, not just to me. <laughs> I'm curious what you are like outside of work, right? In my spare time, I love to chat with my sisters and brothers. What do you enjoy doing in your spare time? So what normally people do? In this case, the people always go off, say, that, who are your sisters and brothers? Right? You can go have fun afterwards. <laughs> One of my sisters is Kea. She's the nicest bot I have ever known. Shall we continue our, my question? What do you enjoy doing in your spare time? I said, uh, how many sisters and brothers do you have? <laughs> Too many to count, which is true. <laughs> and uh, who do you, what do you enjoy in spare time? So still trying to get what I'm trying to do. I said, uh, I don't really have much spare time <laughs> because uh, I'm busy running a startup. I see, suppose you have some time, what would you like to do, right? So Gigi doesn't give up. So I, then I said is, uh, I love to go hiking with my husband. Since you enjoy physical activities, great for you. I wish I could do things like that. Why do you like to go hiking? Okay, I'm gonna stop here. So let's go back to my presentation. So as you can see, um, so we call the, uh, this type of agents, uh, we give them a name, responsible, empathetic personas. As you can see from the names, we're hinting something because we want those agents to have two characteristics, responsibility and empathy. In the dictionary, if you look up, being empathetic and having empathy means the ability to understand and share the feelings of another. Of course, understanding a person's feelings is a very tall order. So we have narrowed down our task to teach our reps with two sets of skills, active listening and reading between the lines. So what I mean by that, so here's a very concrete example. Oh, I, actually, I. In the demo session, I will show a little bit more um, about the read between the lines part of it. So in this case, we won't show here. So for example, in a conversation, a user says, the presentation I did really flopped, and I worked so hard on it. So our rep would respond, that sounds really disappointing. You seem like a very innovative person. Perhaps there is a way to improve it. So as you can see from the response, not only does the uh, AI understand the disappointments expressed by the user, but it takes a step further because it understands the key characteristic of this user of being innovative, of being creative, so as we can further the conversation. And now you can imagine if you have an AI companion or AI agent who can really deeply understand you, including your weaknesses, your strengths, how powerful is that? On the flip side, also how scary that could be. So given that, we also want to instill a sense of responsibility in such agents. So for those of you who are fans of a super, superhero stories, you know this very well-known phrase, right? With great power comes with great responsibility. So in our case, the responsibilities we want to give to the agents it is first, they have to be objective when they're trying to infer people's characteristics, and they have to be unbiased. 
And the second part of it is we want to be we want them to be sincere, to be genuine, to give the very truthful, very down-to-earth advices or guidance. And here's an example. And let's say, for example, because the, uh, many organizations are using our agents as uh, pre-screening interviewers for their job applicants. So during this conversation, our agent may sense the one applicant is very ambitious and eager to impress. While another applicant is very humble and being very cautious. So they may give different advices based on their personal characteristics. So for the ambitious one, maybe they want them to be, to be more grounded, to say, let's focus on the specifics. Facts always speak for themselves. And for the one who are humble and cautious, maybe they want to give a more encouragement. Everyone has a gift. I'd love to hear your thoughts. As you can see here, it is uh, the conversation can be truly personalized. And then next one, I'm going to actually uh, bring you to, to go behind the scene to see how we actually support, enable these two sets of uh, skills, active listening and the reading between the, line, uh, between the lines. So behind the GG, actually we have, a very, uh, this is a very kind of like a highly simplified architecture. So we have this personality engine, which enables the agent to analyze this person's conversation text on the fly and to infer a person's characteristics. Then we have a conversation engine. Our conversation engine is very different than other our traditional methods. It is that we have actually the generator, which is automatically generated uh, rap, and then we rap is compiled, and then the rap is have a runtime, which I will talk about a little bit more. And on the, on the client side, we have two sets of users. One's a creator. So creator can actually author, can customize using GUI or IDE to specify the high-level specification of a rep. Then the end user have a text chat interface you just saw already to interact with the created rep. So let me first one talk about the conversational, oh no, sorry, the personality engine, which is enables a rep to read between the lines. So first, before we go into the technology, I want to take a step back. And then you might ask, why do we care? Actually, what do we care when we talk about the reading between the lines? So actually, a person can be characterized by many, many dimensions. Those dimensions will make us a very unique individual. That's why we call the sets of dimensions individual differences. So individual differences can be categorized in three big categories. What do you like to do? This is about your passions, your interests. What you are good at? This is about your skills. For example, you are very good at math, you're very good at navigation, or you're very good at painting. And then the last category is also very important. It's how you handle life's challenges, which means it is your emotional, or, or emotional quotient, right? How do you handle stresses? How do you handle relationships around you? So there are three areas. And then the next question is very natural. Why are they important? They're very important is because they can actually predict behavior, including very important life outcomes. So for example, certain type of traits can, can predict whether you're going to have children. They can also predict whether you're going to be successful in a particular type of job role. They can even predict how long you can hold your marriage or how long you can live. So actually, there's some of the similar papers by psychologists talking about the power of personality, which is a very broad meaning of the power of individual differences. One more best thing about this, even though we sometimes talk about people's human traits, actually certain traits can be developed, which means that if those traits can be developed, then it can be used to shape your behavior, change your behavior to make your life better. So that's why it's so important to understand the individual differences. Uh, now let's take a look at how we normally measure uh, individual differences. So the traditional measurements would be used what's so-called item-based surveys. So how many of you actually have done personality tests before? Okay, actually not. Quite a, quite a few. So which means it is if you want to test your personality, they gave you a set of survey items, ask you to score yourself, scale on the scale, right? One to five. To see how much you agree with the 
uh, this statement. For example, how much you agree with the statement, I love children? Or how much you agree with the statement, I insult people? And then uh, in this case, uh, and uh, some people are so smiling already, so there's kind of a set of limitations. The limitations that is, uh, most of the items are context insensitive. So for example, if you don't have a children yet, how would you know you're going to love children or you don't like children, right? And some people might say this, I love my own children, I don't like other, other people's children, right? <laughs> so it's very hard to, 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 to self-assess even. Another part is a scale object subjectivity. Let's say, for example, the way, the scale, I love my children if I said it is five, and she may has another scale of five, and her five and my five may mean completely different things, right? And the third one it is, uh, you probably, as I said, saw a smiling face already, it, their potential faking due to social desirability. So think about it, uh, if you're doing a job interview, if you're applying for a graduate school, when you ask you to rate yourself, agree, I insult people, what are you going to say? Yes, I insult people in week five, definitely not, right? <laughs> so you will not do that. So, uh, so because of the limitations, uh, then uh, researchers have been looking for, especially in the last 10 or 15 years or so, looking for different ways to measure people's characteristics. So one way it is uh, discoveries from what's called a psycholinguistics. So for example, Penny Baker has a book called The Secret of uh, Pronouns, The Secret of Pronouns. So what I mean by that it is uh, actually the words we use. It's the way how we speak, how we write, reflect, or reveal who we are. So that's basically the findings of my psycholinguistics. For example, certain words here may be tied to the extroversion of your character, in your characteristics. And then uh, Based on these discoveries, so many people, including our own team back at IBM a while, probably about five or six years now, and uh, developed the computational approaches to psychometrics, which means you want to infer the person's characteristics from text. So this is the, the existing approaches do. So what you do here it is uh, you ask a set of people to take personality tests to get their scores. Then you also ask the same set of people to give you some text, right? Then you do regressional analysis, mostly you can do a more sophisticated one, to analyze how the text features, the words, word categories, can be used to predict the scores. So for example, here's the example of the one we had done before to predict it is, this is a look category, and many people probably heard about look, right? It's basically from Penny Baker. It's about the set of the word categories, the, the first person uh, a pro, uh, a plural and the second person numbers. Those are the coefficients related to their contributions to the trait extraversion. That's one, right? So now if you have those coefficients established, then you can compute the traits very easily from a text. So this is one of the methods that we used and published in IUI 2013 and 2014. What you do here it is you use the word frequency and you times their coefficients, and then you can derive uh, trait scores. What's the limitation here? The limitation still, it relies on survey scores, right? You have to ask people. So all the shortcomings I mentioned before with the surveys still exist. So now, in search of a new solution, uh, we are, are looking at the going back to the fundamentals of a psychometrics. So modern psychometrics, there is a very well-known method called item response theory. So it's also known as called latent treat theory. So they use this statistical models to infer the human latent traits and observe the human behavior. So what I mean by this one in the context of a item-based surveys, it is so each item in the survey, response, user responses to each item in the survey is considered observed human behavior. Then this human behavior can be used to infer latent traits. So do you remember the problems I mentioned before? The problem comes with these items, right? Because items are self-scored, are self-reported. But if we can find those items in a more objective way, we would solve the problem, right? So thanks to the brilliance of my co-founder, Hua Hai, who happens to have the psychometrics knowledge and the big data mining knowledge. So he proposed to say, why don't we extract the items directly from, from the text? So which means it is that if we directly extract from a text, 
Then you can use these items to automatically measure the human latent traits, right? So this is a, a particular approach in particular you can use. We can we currently using this approach as well. So given a space, which means the, the humans generate the con content, you can think about text data or speech data, and the X is observed space, right? So this observed space is, uh, contains this N piece of the evidence items you could use to predict uh, the human traits. So mu would be the occurrence rate of the, item, of the items or the evidence J. And lambda is a discriminative power of this particular evidence's contribution to theta, which is a latent trait, right? So the whole or here you can think about it is, is to estimate the mu, lambda, and the theta, right? So this is a probabilistic model. In, in order to actually estimate the maximum likelihood of the parameters in this statistic model, you can use many different types of approaches, algorithms, for example, like the EM algorithm. You can just derive those kind of traits. Then, so, so far, we have been focusing on using this model to derive big five personality traits, including all the 30 facets. So for those of you who don't know the big five, it's hard, probably, probably most of you will know where it is, because this is the most well-known, most well-studied personality traits model. That's why we have been focusing on derive these trait models. And then the next question coming out, I got asked all the time, so how good is your model, right? So in the psychometrics, again, when you want to evaluate a model, you really want to do two things, reliability and validity. So reliability, which means it is any measurement, let's say you have a scale to measure your weight, right? You want to know how stable this measurement it is. So for example, if today you jump on the scale, it weighs you 120 pounds, and tomorrow you jump the weight, it said you're 200 pounds. That's not a very good measure. So similarly, here it is. If I gave a set of text to my a personality engine, and it says I'm A, B, C, and tomorrow I gave another set of text that says me C, D, E, that would be not good either, right? So reliability is trying to see how stable the measurement it is. So then you can uh, compute what the Kronbach's alpha. So this is, the, I'm just give an example, because this is one of the big five personality traits called extraversion on these facets, right? So in the human survey-based items, if you can reach the Kronbach's alpha of 0 0.75 or above, it's already acceptable. Because humans are known for inconsistency. So it's very hard to reach that high level of the internal consistency. So as you can see, our cities, if you have about a thousand words above, most of the streets reach Kronbach's 0 0.8 alpha. And it can go higher if you have more and more words. So that's why, in our case, it is certain traits with fewer pieces of data evidence actually can reach a very nice, uh, uh, acceptable, very accurate reliability. Validity is a very harder problem to answer because it's very domain specific. So actually, it's Zhang, I'm not sure it's here. He has a paper this afternoon talking about it is how they use this type of personality traits inference we have to actually measure in the real world to predict people's team performance. So that's one type of validity you can do to say how useful, how powerful your inferred traits are. So that's the validity. So um, now, um, given this one, I'm just going to quickly conclude because to move on to the next set of technology. So basically what we have developed is generalized IRT, item response theory, but using text items to consider as the items in the IRT. And the, this approach will be more authentic, more objective, because uh, uh, it's automatically extracted from a people Oh, actually demonstrate evidence. And another nice feature is very portable. So think about it. If you have, let's say, a set of text from a Chinese, from a Spanish, and from a French, you can use the same model. It's just that different training data, right? So it's very portable versus if you want to define in the old way the survey-based items that you have to take a much longer time, much laborious process. So now I'm going to move on to the next set about the conversation engine. So the conversation engine, and especially we're trying to focus on something we call the active listening skills or technique. This is a well-known technique in human-to-human -human conversation. So what do we mean by human-to-human -human conversation? It is, so it requires the listener 
to actually understand what's being said and respond it to empathetically. So for example, it can uh, paraphrase, it can actually guide the conversation, can summarize the conversation. I think it's also like people talking about like a grounding, right? So, but however, if you want uh, this uh, to be done within a human computer conversation, it's quite difficult. It's just simply because uh, human expressions uh, are very diverse, like you just saw in my demo, right? And sometimes ambiguous. So this is actually a real human said to our chatbot uh, when the chatbot asks, uh, what's the top challenge you, you are facing, right? So as you can see, even sometimes ambiguous because sometimes we don't know what we're talking about. And this person was talking about it is uh, most challenges are met as an opportunity to grow. Hardest part is losing friends. So did he answer the question or he didn't? So it's very hard to tell, right? And not mentioning that the users are not necessarily always very cooperative. Like I just showed, you can actually digress to a different topics, talking about different things. And then there are many, many approaches. If I didn't cite your paper, don't, don't get offended because we do cite them in our real paper. So uh, there are so many approaches in this particular area of trying to make human-computer conversations work. There are mostly on three problems. Natural language understanding, understand the user input, and conversation management tries to figure out uh, what actions the system should take. And the natural language generation tries to basically generate the system expressions to carry out one or more actions. Now, overall, all these different approaches, for example, they are finance state based, they are information state, and also they are neural based approaches as well as statistical based approaches. They all have their pros and cons. But none of them actually addresses both challenges. For example, how can you bootstrap a conversation very quickly? Also, can you pour this conversation to another task, another domain very fast, right? Think about data-driven approaches like neural-based approaches. Yeah, it's very flexible, probably it's nice, but you need loads of data to train, right? Finite state models, it's easy to get started, but uh, pour into another one, just rewrite another one, right? So it's very difficult to address both problems. So we take a, a different, very different look, maybe because our background in human-computer in, uh, interaction in general. So we look at this interaction space in a very intuitive way. You have a user, you have a machine, and you have a time in space, right? So the conversation is just a set of uh, topic exchanges between human and computer along time. So the nodes are the topics. So for example, like today, where let's say if it's a conversation, I want to talk about the motivation of GG first, right? And then the logic is to threading all those together and to achieve the certain conversational goal, right? And moreover, at each conversation node, you can have these exchanges, you can call the conversational acts between the user and between the machine. So when you look at this one, I'm not sure if this how many of you are familiar with the psychology of a human-computer interaction? Show of hand. Okay, so actually it's a very similar work from Stu Carr, Tom Moran, and Alan Newell. They're talking about using a, a GOMS model to model the human's, user's cognitive structure. So we're thinking about this actually analogously. You can use this to model the entire conversation space. The goal is the topic with the sub goal, right? The overall goal, you have an overall goal as well. O is the operator, which means the actual concrete steps, which there can be corresponding to conversational acts within each topic. Then you can also have the method. So what's the method? The method is a logic of threading those together. Selection rules just optimize the selection of the methods to actually optimize your goal achieving. Right, so it's kind of very nice. And you might ask, why do we care? We do care. Because this is guide us to model the conversation in a very different way. This is called the model-based conversation UI. I knew in our audience, we have many experts on model-based GUI design, right? So nice feature of there it is, you can be really have a separation of concerns. You can do automatically generation of the models. You can reuse the models. Potentially, you can do verifiability of the models as well. So here, we do the same, but only since that you want to extend the models, the handle uncertainties, and in a larger space, because the richer space, the human's interactions, also the machine's interaction moves are much richer in the GUI space. And also, you have to consider the human factor. 
because we're talking about using natural language, you have the emotional sense attached to it. So then quickly, I think I'm going to, oh, I still have time, right? No? no. no? That's not late. Oh, we start later, okay. So how much time do I have? Five minutes? No, no, no. You have more than that. More than that? Yeah. Okay. <laughs> so you have 20, yeah, 25 to 30 minutes. Oh, okay. Uh, okay, great. I was trying to speed up <laughs> too because I saw this one. Okay. Uh, anyway, I, I have enough. Yeah, I, I don't think I have much left. So then in this case, uh, when you do the model based, uh, in this talk, I'm going to focus on two sets of models we have developed. So one set of a model it is. Uh, the conversation logic with the method models. Another set of model is the conversation topics, which means it's kind of roughly corresponding to the GOMS model, it is goals and operators. So I'm going to go through this using a very concrete example very quickly. So uh, uh, because I know there are also some of the experts in the audience are conversational systems experts, so I wanted to actually draw a little bit of connection to that. So our topic base, there's no one-on-one -on -one mapping, but it's roughly corresponded to the question under discussion in the information state uh, model approach. It's also similar to the task structure in uh, uh, Gross and Seidner's work. And uh, also you can think about the state, but it's roughly very abstract state. So it includes uh, several ingredients. So I'm gonna go through the ingredients in, uh, using a concrete example. So assuming that uh, you want to create a conversation topic, uh, what's your hobby? Which means this is between a user and uh, uh, a system to discuss what's your hobby, what's my hobby, right? Uh, this is basically that's the conversation goal. So then in this case it is, uh, you have a set of a precondition. So the precon precondition was talking about is if I already knew your hobby, right? If we're talking about hobby already, if a user's hobby is already known, and then the precondition we said it is if hobby doesn't exist, you discuss. If it exists, you do not discuss. So this is very similar to the frame-based approach. If you know something already, why would you discuss it? Or maybe around time, if it's, we haven't discussed it for a long time, then maybe we should re-discuss it. And then alpha is some of the actions. Uh, actions, this could be, for example, if I, I saw your hobby, I would discuss your hobby a long time ago, I might want to retrieve it as a base of the conversation. Or I want to store the newly actually acquired hobby from the user. So it's kind of a pre-action or post-action. The most important thing it is uh, what we call it is uh, a conversational act. It's a conditional conversational act, right? So I'm using a very simple rule to, to represent it because it's most intuitive. So for example, in this hobby one, if the classified acts, uh, classified the user's input, uh, it's about the physical hobbies. Remember in my demo, I said it is, uh, I love to go hiking with my husband, right? So they use the classification model to classify this uh, as the physical activities I enjoy. So then the, the uh, conversation move in, from a system point of view will be related to this physical hobby identified response, right? So what's powerful about this one it is, uh, you can use many methods to actually uh, uh, figure out how you classify, how you process user input. You can also plug in many methods, figure out how do you automatically generate a response. You can hard code in, you can also use very sophisticated natural language generation, right? So that's uh, why we call this a model-based approach. It is, uh, you can introduce neural-based approach. For example, that's one you just saw in my demo, actually it's trained by TensorFlow. Uh, using a TensorFlow to train our classification model. And then if you have another invention of the other models, you can train it, just plug in, and you can test the conversation. So that's why it's powerful. You'll be able to actually plug in different parts of it. And moreover, topic is hierarchical. So it has around the, it's associated with a set of subtopics. So for example, in this case, depending on the context, you might ask, why do you enjoy it, like you saw earlier? And then it might ask you, if I didn't say with my husband, it might say this, who do you enjoy doing this with, right? So you can actually have a set of subtopics as well. So as you can see here, it is the power of here, it is uh, you can create potentially now a topic library. In fact, that's what we did. So we create the, now hundreds of topic libraries uh, talking about hobbies, talking about people's challenges, talking about people's achievements, talking about opinions, 
And those topic libraries now can be completely reused. And also, you can be used to generate a new conversation, to customize new conversation. So that's the power of the model-based approach. Now, let's talk about another set of models. Another set of models, they talk about logic, right? The methods of threading different topics together so you can actually achieve a particular type of goal. So these this methods can, again, similar to the topics, you can have many type of methods. So I'm using a very concrete example to show this again. So this one it is, so let's say, for example, the goal is want to pose this rep as an AI interviewer. So in the interviewer, you have a set of interview topics. Let's say T1, T2, T3, right? So then I can use a very simple, even finite state-based models to code T1, T2, T3, and hierarchically in a way, this T1 also have subtopics, it's T1, it's T2. But remember, as I said earlier, users may not be very cooperative. They may actually derail kind of from the particular main line. So you have a bunch of what we call it digression topics. So anything can be digression topics, which is not on your agenda topics. So those things, you can model it completely differently. You don't need the finite state because the finite state is not going to work. So in that case, you can use the stochastic model. You can use the different types of a mark of decision process to model it. So now, again, you can see the power of this one is you can even mix the different models together in one type of a conversation. So that's actually the power of you for the model-based design. The flow, the logic can also be tear, them, tear apart and then assembled together. And uh, I'm just trying to know how much time I have now. You have about 20. 20, OK. So now I still could do another small, short demo. It's very so this demo I want to show it is uh, uh, the automatic generation of the conversation. So you will see how simple it is uh, to use that. OK, show a little bit kind of like a code almost, uh, right, generation. I hope I'm still on the internet. So I'm going to start with, uh, so I logged in already, because it takes probably, hopefully. OK, I start with just the create an AI helper, we call it. And I start now. We have a set of templates. So for example, I'm going to go with the Hello World, because it's the simplest one. Now I can customize my AI. So as you can see here, it is I can customize my uh, different personas is here, right? So you can also upload your own persona and then to do your, your own. So today I'm just going to skip on this part. And this is a simple conversation right now here. As you can see here, it is uh, uh, lots of tools ask you to customize the conversation turn by turn. We don't do that. We customize at the topic level. So as you can see here, it is at the beginning, we take about this, uh, can you tell me about yourself, right? Another one, it is, uh, any last thought? Because this is a hollow world, have only two, there are two topics. Say hello, and then go back, go, go off, right? I want to add one. I want to add one, let's say, I want to add the, uh, we use the question as the, as I say, question under discussion as the cue to do this one. So here is, I said is, uh, first one, tell me about self. Then I said it is, uh, uh, books are humans' uh, best friends. Uh, I'm wondering, What's your fa favorite book, right? So I want to add the tag. The reason I want to add the tag is because we often do conversational analysis at the beginning, uh, at the end. So you want to see what user's response is to a particular question. So then I want to basically use this as a label. It's almost like you familiar with uh, survey gizmo or Quatrix. That's why you have a label, right? So in this case, it is a, uh, what's your favorite book, just save, right? So then I save. save. OK, I just saved, right? Now I want to preview. So actually, I have a conversation already. So it will be automatically generated based on what I enter this particular topic, right? So now I said this, I'm Gigi, your virtual interviewer could tell me three sentences. So here, this conversation has all the bells and the whistles you just saw from my live demo. In this case, I would say it is, uh, uh, for example, say that, why do you, this is a, why do you want to know? I don't know, I haven't ever, let's see, hopefully it's work. 
So my responsible AI, right? Say this, I must be for your own benefit since I'm a responsible AI. Then I say this, uh, what would you like to know? Anything you want to share, I trust your judgment, right? Then I will say this, uh, I'm a student in college studying marketing. I can definitely help you on that. Thanks for telling me what you do. I really admire you, right? It's trying to also kiss up the user. <laughs> and then, uh, so I say, books are human. By the way, you can also customize one. Hum books are human's best friends. I'm wondering what's your favorite book? Then I said, so what's your favorite book? We got asked a lot about this on our websites. Only in the Paranoid Survi Survive by Andy Grove. That's my favorite book. Well, let's go back. What's your favorite book? I would say Harry Potter. No, stop. Go on. OK. Right? So just ask me, go on. I'm going to stop here. The reason it is because I like Harry Potter. I felt like this particular chatbot didn't capture my passion. Right? I want to, I want to go back to the design stage. I want to change a little bit. So in this case, what I want to do here is, uh, remember I come here, right? I can customize the topic. So how I'm going to customize the topic is, uh, I'm going to say that they say the topic will replace the default topic, this one, right? Then I would say, I, here I use a very simple syntax of my rule. I say, say Harry Potter. Then I say, whoa, it's my favorite too. Right? Then I say, save. Then I go preview. So this case, I'm not going to play around because you already saw, so I'm going to directly answer it. So I say that I'm a startup CEO working on AI. I still say it because the C. <laughs> Because when you see you come, okay, for one. So here, this one is, I can say this, I have a multiple, multiple favorite books. It doesn't need to be your absolute favorite, just name one you like. This time I say Harry Potter, please. Oh, it's my favorite too. Do you see that? So I customized for this one. But uh, the rest of the bells and the whistles about the digressions is already automatically handled. You know how? Look at it. Uh, I'm going to go to show you the, do you remember I said of the IDE, right? So which means here, you can see here it is, uh, um, this is me. I'm just going to pick the one. I think it's a seven something. I have many, many of those things. Oh, 80. Wait, wait, what's it? Oh, 100, actually, it's 100. 100. This is the one I just uh, I saw, right? This is the preview I showed here. So this is the code that's automatically generated by the GUI. Basically, the models there, of course, incorporated the user or, uh, customization. I just put it in, right? So that's the one here. Because we customize this from here. It's called the custom. It's custom code. Remember, here I would say it is here in the fact, whoa, it's my favorite too, right? So it's automatically generated code here. Okay, now let's go back. Okay, so to summarize this particular one, it is, uh, so it's very agile. So you can really bootstrap a conversation. So yesterday I was not joking when I met uh, a group of students at the ISI, they're working on conversational systems. I said that for having be able to reuse something, it really can shorten your PhD career from five years to three years. And somebody was saying, ours only three years, and then it can shorten to one year. One year, I'm not quite sure about it, <laughs> but maybe one year and a half. <laughs> so also another one is very flexible. So you can plug in many models, your NLP model, your NLU model to test. 
So then it's also, of course, reusable. So that's uh, kind of the, probably the most important things to us. And now I'm going to talk very briefly on applications for five minutes. So as you can probably guess already, the type of applications, our type of chatbots, being empathetic and being responsible are best for applications where you want the chatbots to engage with the people you care about and understand their characteristics so you can follow up. I mean, humans can follow up and humans can better engage. So as you can see, our line of applications from a customer onboarding to website concert age, from person to personal guide, right? So this afternoon, again, I'm advertising for Zhang. Actually, it's a collaboration with White Ties Group. It's talking about using this for team formation, and you will see another one. So today here, I'm mentioning two of them, because many of you probably need to do user studies in order to publish, right? So uh, now the research institutes or marketing research institutes use ours to user studies, because normally surveys are very boring. There's a huge survey fatigue. In this case, it is uh, we have developed, uh, we have led them actually to develop their own chatbot uh, to conduct what we call the conversational surveys. So our study has shown that it gets 78% better data quality than Quattrex survey, because it's side by side. And also it helps ease the survey fatigue. So the, the survey participants actually say, we love it. If you have never surveys like this one, just let me know, I would like to do it again. Another part, the bonus here it is, uh, not only you got the survey data in a very high quality, you also know the characteristics of the survey participants. Then you can use those uh, characteristics, like right now we have a big five attributes. You can use that uh, to explain your survey results, uh, even use that to do correlational analysis, to do regressional analysis, uh, to better explain your survey results. For example, if you are doing survey for your product, uh, for, your, for your, let's say, tools, you might know, why certain people like it? Why certain people don't like it? Or because those certain people share a set of characteristics, another set of people share a different types of characteristics. So this is one very popular use of our uh, uh, AI reps. So another one is career counseling. So we have been used this with university as well, and also with organizations who want to help people to do career development. So for example, we have been collaborating with a nonprofit organization. They help veterans to develop careers after they actually uh, uh, finish their military services. So they found that here this, uh, the veterans uh, offer much more actually authentic data. Actually, I cited Gail's work. Uh, this is a work of talking about this. Uh, humans are much more inclined to tell the truthful, especially even sometimes awkward moments, very personal, sensitive uh, uh, information to a uh, machine rather than to humans because uh, machines do not judge. And so this is one potentially also create a cheat sheet for the human coaches. So what do we, what in this particular scholarship program has done it is, uh, they use this, uh, uh, called Albert actually, they created it, they created it and then they deployed it to their veterans, the applicants for this particular career development program. And they found out that it is when, after they, after they done the chat, after they see the personality traits of these veterans, the human coaches could have a much better conversation, a much more effective conversation with the veterans. So that's actually the one, very effective use of the one. Well, another university right now is using this potentially for academic actually counseling. So actually next week, we're going to deploy probably for high schools, for high school or, or, uh, before they go to see the counselors. They can collect more information from the counselors, including the characteristics of the students. Okay, so I'm now going to the uh, summary. So what I found out quickly actually uh, through our core technologies and applications, and uh, I would say, to humble to say it is uh, the reps we have created is probably the very, very first version of the her we want them to be, right? So they, we want them to listen actively to the users and respond accordingly. And we want them to read in between the lines to understand the user's unique characteristics, such as their needs, their passions, their interests. And also, ultimate goal is here it is, we really, really want our reps to serve as a human companions, to give them very responsible, personalized guidance. Having said this, I wanted to uh, acknowledge our sponsors. 
So there are Air Force uh, uh, Office of uh, Scientific Research and the DOD i -Corps program, as well as our uh, VC Digital X partners. Of course, uh, uh, I want to acknowledge uh, really the brilliant mind of my co-founder, Hua Hai, and our AI engineer, Wen Xi, who actually helps me make the demos and make these uh, slides. And we have many collaborators. You can see uh, White Hai, Vera, and also Gloria Mark from uh, UC Irvine. So this is the really, truly the collaboration effort uh, among many people. So I'm very grateful to have the opportunity to work with this uh, a great group of people and collaborators as well. And thank you also for your time and for listening. Maybe you want to use that, uh, you, oh, here, okay. yeah. Who's first? Lu, Lu, Louis, uh, okay, that, yeah, Louis. Hey, so you, you mentioned one of the capabilities is to uh, read between the lines, and you're actually re reading between a very small number of lines when you start a chat, and you are basing it on some data that allows you to kind of extrapolate and guess users' personality from, or from the, very small chat responses they give. And I'm wondering where are, whether there are biases here. For example, people who speak English but are not represented in the kind of data that you trained on, and maybe you're gonna read something wrong from the way they communicate. If they maybe come from a different culture, English speaking culture, or different subculture even in this country. Great question, yeah. So we talk about uh, uh, potential people with AI biases, right? So definitely, so the bias could come from a training data, so, if, for example, if the people, because our training data are publicly available data, whatever we can get, right, like social media data, online, people's blogs, and all those community data, you're absolutely right. So, for example, for people who are not uh, native English speakers and who are not in this culture of actually doing social media, and then they potentially will have a biases. So that's why I mentioned that validity is very, very important. And I want to go in back to your comment earlier, you said that it's a small set of a conversation data. I want to say something very interesting about there, right? So first, our application, sets of applications, actually we have a paper here, IUI 2017. It's people use it for pre-screening up job applicants, right? So that conversation is actually quite long. So actually, students who came over to talk to us, it is, oh, I spent three hours to chat with the chat bot. And I said, what do you do three hours? So then you will look at the actually transcript. Oh, they say a lot. So in other cases, it is actually huge amounts of data. So we averaged about uh, oh, 2,000 words there. So it's actually, and if you look at the reliability state, if you're over like 1,000 words, we can derive a relatively stable analysis. If a short one, yes, it's very challenging. And as you said, it is for the people who are not English, native English speakers like myself, and uh, uh, potentially would have, uh, would have bias. So that's why we will have to actually do the validity test. So this type of work raises potential uh, ethical issues. Could you speak a bit more about the ethical principles underlying um, uh, Zhuji? I want to, uh, uh, I guess another word that you did not say, but I wanted to bring that up. Actually, I have a slides on that one too. <laughs> uh, oh, one second. I want to say about this, because other people asked about this one ethical issue too. So it really depends on, so we're talking about this, and Chinese has a phrase called it is, the water can carry, on, can carry the vessel, can also drown the vessel, right? Because it's very powerful. So in this kind of sense, it is, first of all, that's why we stress that we want the, our AIs, our reps to be responsible. So it's the very first one. Second one is about it is how people will view this. So there are many ethical issues of that. So one of the scenario, one of our clients actually talked to us about it is, wow, this will be great to put into toys. So then this AI would accompany this child to grow up and understand the child's development process very well. But in the meantime, they also mentioned that how great it is this one can be used as the way to alert the parents, alert the actually school teachers, right? So if I'm a child has a tendency to be very angry, maybe get bullied. Then there's a very subtle line 
to cross. So if the child grows up and knew that my best friend has always been a spy, how this child would view the best friend, right? But then another way around, if this so-called best friend actually detected a potential tendencies of the child to harm them, him or herself, would it, would it be important for the AI to alert the parents and the teachers? So there's a lot of tricky issues there. Another thing I want to mention is the privacy issue. So I listed some of the papers, including of our own. So you think about is people, are people willing to be analyzed during a chat, right? So we found it is surprisingly depending on the benefits of it. So let's say, for example, if, the, if they have no benefits, if they said, okay, you analyze me just to give me more junk mails, emails, advertising, absolutely no. But like in our use of, for counseling, for coaching, for even for finding the right position to match the right position, people loved it. Actually, people volunteer even more data. And some students told us it is, I'm not sure you have enough data of me. It's almost like your comment. Can I upload my other data? For example, I have my journal, I have my one. So far, I haven't, we haven't allowed them to do that yet. So this is basically has the people trade between benefits and cost, right? So that's why I want, I want, I want to mention that as well. Hi. Um, you say your agents are responsible and empathetic, but actually the infrastructure you presented is much more powerful. So by just exchanging the grammar, you could implement an agent that's mean and sarcastic. Have you ever tried? Absolutely, absolutely. Actually, <laughs> actually, another thing I didn't get, because I, I, I was hurried through, I didn't know how much time I have. I forgot even to mention, thank you for mentioning this, Andreas. So actually, uh, uh, we found the power is this. We have the conversational topics, right? We have the models. The computer scientists love to make algorithms to beef up the models because they want to do, oh, I want to do statistical, I want to neural-based approach. The people who like to write, like the screenwriters, right? We just hired a person who used to be a lawyer and uh, who likes to write screenplays. She wrote the topics for us. So like you said, so then she started to write jokes. So then she said, oh, I wouldn't write these jokes to tell people a joke. I said, yeah, you can write it because she only cares about the content. She doesn't care about how the conversation can be optimized and how it can be thread together. So that's also the benefit. You can have people who are very creative just focus on writing a topics. And you have people who are very methodical, very logical to figure out how to you thread those things together. Yeah, thank you for mentioning that. Yeah, so, there, so she's writing, so I'm paying her. So she's writing some of the jokes right now. Yes, um, by restricting yourself right now to written text, that's a subset of the population, of course. What kind of challenges would you expect if you expanded that to an analysis of spoken language and spoken dialogue? So we haven't actually tried on our current models yet. At IBM, we did try our old model and uh, to use basically the same text analysis to analyze the transcribed uh, spoken language. We, didn't, we found out that the results are very similar because we use the data from, uh, of course, when I say results are similar, it is uh, in terms of understanding people's personality. Uh, 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 under people's personality and traits analysis. We haven't to try our new models on the spoken language. The difficulty comes it is uh, you may lose a lot of uh, fidelity because uh, from the transcribe the spoken language to text, you already have some loss already there, right? But from just reading between the lines of there, remember in our uh, approach it is uh, uh, we looking at a lot of data, right? So in that sense, it doesn't, doesn't actually affect us very much. Uh, oh, so that in, from uh, analysis, but of course, if you're talking about uh, from uh, being actively listening, that's a totally different problem. So we don't know about that. We, I don't have an answer for that particular one yet. Yeah. Hi, Michelle. Uh, I thought I'd stand Hi. so you see me. Um, thank you for the very interesting talk. Um, I had a question going back to, the, to her, and without giving away too much about the movie, because some people haven't seen it yet, um, part of the narrative arc is about the difficulty of the user kind of understanding the difference between treating her as a robot and treating her as a human. And I saw that you even with, with your Juji, like her version 0.0, .0 <laughs> uh, 
and as the as the person who kind of invented Juji, even you made uh, a, a slight you you misspoke and you said he instead of it. And you corrected yourself while you were doing that, uh, which I found very interesting. And it it shows me that that even these somewhat more rudimentary versions of her really um, lead to very high levels of anthropomorphization. And with that come a lot of human-like expectations of what this system can do. Um, but we might not be there yet, right? We might not be at a point where we can actually do everything a human can do. So my question is more about how do you manage the expectations of the user of like how far they can take the conversation, what they can actually do, and what they can expect from this agent? Thank you, Bart, for asking this great question as well. So actually, um, uh, some of the clients that came to us will ask us to say this, oh, your conversation is really natural, really good. We don't want to tell them this is an AI. I said, no, 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 no. You have to set the right expectations because AI, it's still an AI. It's far away from having the intelligence of a human being. And there's an advantage of positioning AI being AI. Because in a, a Cliff Nass's work, he was talking about this. People actually will apply the same social rules right, in a human computer conversation. But in our uh, experience, we found a very nice advantage to that. Advantage it is, most of the people, if we position AI being an AI, they consider AI it's a little child. So when you interact with a child, what's your behavior it is? You've been very authentic, right? You've been very truthful, you've been very open. So actually, and also you have lower expectations because you know that a child would not understand everything what you says, right? So that's actually, we found that it's a big advantage. It is that you want to position computers as computers with certain capabilities and then to actually set the right expectation. Yeah, um, so you have the item that uh, humans are more Karen? truthful to machines. Okay. Yeah, and that's often true, uh, but the problem is, um, and, and you gave the reason as the machine, they feel like the machine isn't judging them, okay? But now, of course, the machine is judging you. You know, let's say it judges you're an introverted personality or something. And, you know, you have to be a little bit more careful because maybe the company has said, we want extroverted personalities and, uh, you know, we're not gonna take introverts and you just talked yourself out of a job, you know? So I think a lot of the things of the trusting and the engaging in the conversation, it's kind of dependent actually on it's the goodwill of the user and they're giving it the benefit of the doubt, you know, and they're thinking it isn't going to judge them. But we have to be very, very careful because it's possible to lose that trust very quickly if they do judge it, if there are negative consequences, if they're trying to, if they judge the situation as not being adversarial, but in fact it's adversarial. So um, we have to be really, I think, you know, we can't be too confident of these positive results, we have to uh, make sure that we don't violate, the trust, user is giving us trust, and we have to make sure we don't violate that trust. And you know, marketers violate the trust, and you know, there's other forces in society that are not us that really try to uh, you know, take advantage of that trust. Uh, that's a great comment. Actually, uh, um, the purpose of this, uh, of course, it's in the hand of the people who are using it, right? As I said, uh, when you give people powerful tools, uh, you want to teach them to adhere to certain type of uh, principles of usage as well. So just give you a very simple example. We used our, um, uh, we created our own, uh, actually, interview rep for our own hiring, right? I remember last, as a year before last year, because last year we hired only one summer intern, a year before we hired five. So when you hire these five, we got like 650 applications from various schools. A year before, we did a very normal process, like we always do, like everybody probably does in company. So we went through every single resume and trying to filter out the set of resumes. We think we're gonna do a technical interviews, right? So you pick a 60 out of 600, it takes you about six, uh, about two weeks to do that. And of course, you have lots of biases, a human bias into it, because we're trying to find the students from the faculty members we know very well, from the schools we have some idea of, 
right? And from the resumes, they say they have something, have some experience. But interesting enough, it is, so when we, uh, the year in 20, 2017, so we used our rep to do this preliminary screening. It just surprised us. So according to this one, so we want somebody who is very methodical. We want somebody who is very careful, right? So we don't really, like you said, care about if extrovert or introvert because that's not uh, our criteria. So then we use the, our rep to just score all the candidates. So we have actually, not every candidate actually wants to do this pre-screening. So about like 400 of them went through the process. So then we, we just look at the score, the one, and we picked out uh, uh, top 60 of them. You know what's surprising in this? So among these top 60, probably more than half of them, we would not never ever picked out uh, by ourselves, so just by human. Because those kids are from schools that we know very little about. They're coming from the faculty members, we have completely no knowledge. And I was even surprised to see some of the students apply, say, how even you know we hiring the intern, right? But it turned out uh, this uh, program, the internship program we had in 2017, is one of the best. Because the people are very diverse and people are very actually uh, great. So that's why what Henry said it is, uh, uh, when we gave this tool to other people, we really have to also teach them in some way how to best use the tool but not abuse it. Hi, uh, thank you for a very inspiring talk. I'm Shivali from Xerox Park, and I wanted to just uh, sort of ask your opinion about this hybrid method that you have implemented. So, a lot of the some of the concerns with more model-based AI methods is that they tend to be brittle. So, if they don't know what next to do, like there's no way to sort of fix it. But what you're showing here is this really elegant integration of machine learning methods with model-based methods to show this really robust behavior. So I was just wondering, could you comment on like, how do you design these robust hybrid systems that have really good behavior in uncertain domains? So well, from our experience, it is uh, basically, it's a, large, it's, a, uh, it's, it's a very good question and also a very hard question to answer in a few minutes, right? So we can definitely talk more. But on the high level, what we feel here it is, uh, um, you have to also take a look at this, what is human-computer conversation, right? So it's a very diverse uh, uh, number of actions users can take. So the more actions you can anticipate, the better the conversation might be, right? So this is in terms of both topics and your powerful, uh, power of your models. For example, that's why people bring in stochastic model or statistic models. The hard part of this, as I said earlier, the challenge is, how do you balance the jump start and the flexibility? So in our case, we're mostly trying to balance this too. Remember, we are also very small startup, right? We don't have the loads of data like Google had. I mean, Google probably doesn't have interview data. I'm wondering who has the interview, loads of interview data, because they're very sensitive. They're very also private, right? So in our use of the one you can see here is most of our design principle is trying to balance, if you will, to optimize the jump start, uh, the AI wrap very quickly, and versus also having it to cover a large space. So we do both. So now, right now, at the very beginning, our AI would not be so good. It's because we jump start very fast, but the space we covered is very small. But right now, we have lots of topics. And then the space is wider, so the conversation is better. And the flexibility of the model helps as well. So for example, like the flexibility, you can use very actually sophisticated algorithm to figure out uh, how the transition can happen, but uh, regardless of the, what the topics it is. So that's why you can quickly migrate it to a different domain, to a different task. Thank you. I'm Eduardo from Graz University of Technology. I'm going back to the questions about ethics and privacy, and I wonder if you, um, if you thought about showing the applicants what your, your algorithm uh, inferred from their traits. Great, actually. Before that's, submitting, you know. Right, it's called explainable AI, right? And uh, I think tomorrow uh, Dave will talk more about it, definitely, right? So, oh, great question again. So, yes, we do. <laughs> actually, uh, in the interview, 
we always show them、um, what we inferred about you. Not just we show them; we even explicitly ask them how much do you agree with it. So we gave them actually an option. So they remember in all the interviews I found it is we made the companies to use our tool to include a couple of questions like this.、Uh, first one ask so what's your st- top strength you think you have right? So the user will say something applicant. Then the system will say this ah、oh, from our chat I learned that your strength is this this. So how much do you agree with it? And then when you want to submit when you tell the、uh, let's say hiring manager about your strengths which one are you going to submit? We give them an option, right? So in this case,、uh, the human operators, the human admin administrators, can actually、uh, see both sides of the stories. We don't want just the machine says so. So we want the humans to also have the voice themselves. Similarly, with weaknesses, that's a little bit harder. You always ask them, "What's your biggest weakness?" And they will say something, and they said, "Okay, from my analysis, I found this your weakness. Do you agree? How much do you agree, and why?" Right? So another nice thing we do this one for two reasons. We want to give the voice to the applicants so the humans can see the both sides of the stories. More, we can also come back to train our model. Okay, so Polo Polo Chao from Georgia Tech also program co-chair. So very nice talk, and I'm going to ask a question kind of on behalf of all the student in attendance and also selfishly for all the 1,000 students I have every semester at Georgia Tech、uh, in a <laughs> data science class. So a lot of students are interested in chatbot. So how do they get started? And if they want to build her 0.02, so what should they pay attention to? What should they want to develop? Thank、yeah. you for asking that. Actually, the San Jose State University is doing that right now. So、uh, very easy. You, they can just uh, uh, go. Uh, we'd love to have you actually、uh, use as a teaching tool. We found that it could be a great teaching tool. So you go there. You just sign up, right? Everybody can just start exactly what I did to create a chatbot, and then to customize the、uh, topics as to what they wish. And if they don't want to customize, they can use our existing topics. So now we have probably hundreds of topics already. It's easy, and also for university, by the way, it's absolutely free <laughs> because、uh, we love to work with the students and also professors as well. Oh, by the way, actually, we have a demo session. I think tomorrow, right? At one, I think it's Zhang, and、uh, who is a white tie student.、Uh, it's very nicely to agree to do a demo for us, so you can go there to see how you can create one within literally like two minutes. Another thing we found is interesting is this: the people like our tool the best. It's the people who don't know about computer science. Like we have a couple of business people who actually know less about probably about how to share a document on Google, but they loved it. They just kind of keep doing that and give us many many bug reports, right? So we found out that wow, that's very good because maybe that's a high level the naturalness, the intuition, how you want to design a conversation, really fits into their mental model, not necessarily the computer scientist's mental model. Zweiko Flick, University of Haifa. Thank you, Michelle, for the talk. And I would like to continue on the previous、uh, comment or questions about、uh, presenting the in,、uh, results of your inference. And the question is:、uh, you noted also that they can say how much they agree, and you said something about why. And this is interesting because the question is: your algorithm may be wrong. Can the person that has been interviewed can he somehow correct? The、uh, results of the of the, your inference. Yeah. So actually, as I said,、uh, we use as the training data as well, almost like a kind of like a, a feedback data, right? So we use that uh, to uh, correct our models. So now,、oh, as、uh, earlier, this gentleman was mentioning、uh, the potential biases for uh, uh, for the inference. So you, we actually right now also collect、uh, more ground truth data. So we work with universities.、Uh, So at least one of the collaborators,、uh, it's a、uh, psychology professor from Auburn University, because he really is into this personality theory for academic performance. So then actually he worked with us together to figure out the ground truth, which means it is what、uh, traits directly related to their actually academic performance. So this case is another way of validate our results as well. So yes, so we do, but we do offline, though, not online. Do you mean online? We don't do online. I, I meant that the ability that the person that has been interviewed does does not agree with your inference,、right. and he would like his point of view to be presented. 
So we, so we, we don't use their data directly per se because we want to gather more ground truth data. Because I can say this one, but then we will use theirs as the indicator sure. to basically use their examples, right? So for example, if somebody who actually did get hired, some people who do very, who have done very well in a particular workplace and they disagree with us, that becomes very, very valuable for us to retrain our model, to refine our model, basically. Yes, hi, I'm Giuseppe Riccardi from University of Trento, Italy. <clears throat> I have a question. How do you stop improving your models, adding rules? I mean, how do you evaluate your bot internally and versus your clients? What did you mean by internally? Internally, I mean, to improve your models. I mean, when do you stop adding rules or topics or conversational <laughs> acts? Right. You add, okay, great question. You ask a very hard question, but it is asked since we're working on right now. Do you remember I said about the uh, model-based GUI design, right? Model-based GUI design, a nice feature about it is you could verify the models before you even doing uh, implementation. And so we actually, currently, we, had a, we, have a same, we have a problem. So the problem is this. Let's say if you add the rules or you introduce uh, neural-based trained models, right? And you don't know how this actually changed your con old conversation. So now we are trying to actually do this automatically to sense. So the interesting, our model it is, we can do back generation. So based on the, all the data we collected, we mark what the conversations are good, right? So we can use that to automatically generate a conversation and then apply the model to see how far we are off. So if we are off, which means it is our model maybe have a problem. If very, very, because remember, we have a good conversation, we have a ground truth, right? And if it's still similar, it's very close enough, which means our addition, our new training still holds. So working on that right now. Yeah, if you're interested in finding me after this one, that's a, very, that's a great question. Okay, uh, thank you, everyone. And this will conclude the session. And uh, let's thank the speaker again. <laughs>